Today is World Communion Sunday, as I already mentioned. Uh, just a couple additional pieces of information for you. Uh, Jean Luminet will be reading our scripture here shortly. I have asked him to read it first in Creole and then in English. Uh, following the singing of the hymn by Bonnie and Renita, uh, excuse me, Brian and Renita, uh, we will be, the, the morning message will come from Egon Sawatsky. I had the privilege of meeting Egon this morning. I did just want to tell you a little bit of information about Egon. As, uh, in the email that Egon sent me, he said uh, he was born and grew up in a Mennonite Christian family in Asuncion, Paraguay. Uh, he was saved at the age of 17 and baptized the same year. After school, he went to seminary and got a bachelor in theology. He worked in a discipleship school in Basel, Switzerland, and at Thunder Bay in Canada. And now he is a youth pastor at the Mennonite Brethren Church in Ascension. He also volunteers with the Mennonite World Conference, and that is specifically why he is here this week. Uh, I, I believe you said there was seven, six, six, seven, so a group of people <laughs> who met together at Lancaster Mennonite High School this week Doing the planning, the Mennonite World Conference is coming to Harrisburg in July of 2015. And so the plans are underway for that. I would hope that a number of people could attend uh, as part of the Mennonite family. Uh, we do indeed have sisters and brothers around the world. And once every, I don't know, five years? Six years. Every six years, thank you. Once every six years. Uh, that members of that family have the opportunity to gather. So that will be in 2015. Now, Egon also writes, I am single, I do have a girlfriend, and I'm 27 years old, and I don't think you have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought you might find it interesting. <laughs> and so, at this point, well, you come and read for us, please. Read the scripture, yes. Good morning. The scripture this morning is from Matthew 22, verse 34, 40. So, and the scripture is going to be read in two languages, in English and in Creole. So, let's read the Creole part. Les pharisiens ont entendu Jésus te faire main bouche ça de Seigneur. Ils ont réuni ensemble. Il y en a yo qui ont avocat posé lion question pour tendre lui. Il dit: Mais qui commandement dans la loi qui est plus important? Jésus dit lui: C'est ouvrir les mains bon Dieu, c'est yo à tout cœur, à tout âme à toute l'idée. C'est le commandement ça qui est premier, qui est plus important. Mais deuxièmement, les mêmes gens, ou va les mêmes prochains, les mêmes gens pour les mêmes têtes. C'est pour deux commandements ça, toute la loi à prophétie, il y a quand même. The English part. Hearing that Jesus had challenged the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with his question. Teacher, which is the greatest commitment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commitment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophet hang on these two commandments. Egon, may the Lord bless you as you bring this message. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Well, I guess you guys know all about me now. <laughs> um, yes, I want to apologize beforehand because of my English. It might be not the best English you've heard. Um, 
actually at home we speak German, I grew up in Paraguay so we speak Spanish as well and the only English I learned was from Canada so if you hear a A or some <laughs> stories about moose and bears don't be surprised. I actually wanted to tell part of my story today um, not because I think my story is that spectacular or anything but because I think that it shows how gracious our God is and I think that that is what happened throughout the whole Bible people, stel uh, people telling stories about God and how God had worked in their lives not just in individuals but in the whole group and the whole in his people in the Israelite people people's life we see God's work all through the Bible and uh, they couldn't have written it just right away when it happened so what they did was actually gather um, with their families and telling their kids about what was what happened before and so on from one generation to another generation and I think that is a very good tradition that that is a very rich tradition and can teach a lot of what happened and teach where how the future might be in some cases as um, Alan said I I was born and grew up in Asuncion Paraguay um, my grandparents were born in Russia the Russian Mennonites that had to flee from Russia eight years ago and go well they went to Paraguay different groups went to different places but my grandparents went to Paraguay so my parents were already born there my parents after they got married they moved to the city to the capital city of Paraguay Asuncion um, leaving the Mennonite colonies behind but still remaining in the faith the Mennonite faith the faith in God so I was born there in the city um, nothing very important happened I guess um, I went to school, which is quite boring, uh, right? And um, I didn't, I wasn't really interested in studying and stuff, so I just did what I needed to do and never got the best grades, but um, I needed to at least pass the grade, the classes, I guess. Um, so when, when I was 15 years old, 16 years old, um, people, my friends would get baptized. Um, I didn't really need to because I grew up in a church and I thought, well, this is enough, right? I'm in a church anyways, so whatever. And um, I went for one summer, I went up to the colonies to work with my uncle. He had, he had a bakery um, just to do something else. And I met a few, a few friends um, who had a very non-Christian lifestyle. Well, at least what we were doing when we were together was not very Christian. And while we were doing different stuff, it was not too bad, but it wasn't really good either. They were, um, they were telling me about how they got baptized just a few months ago. And I said, well, that's great. <laughs> and this is how you show that you love Jesus. And that's when I started asking myself, there has to be more than just a bad baptism and then go on to church and just like that. So I started asking questions. I started um, looking for God, searching God. I started reading the Bible, talking to people about it. And th somehow that is the process how I got saved, um, how I turned to Jesus and how I told Jesus that I, I loved him and I wanted to, to seek him. So after school, um, I was finishing school. I was in my last year. I had to decide what to do next, right? Um, so I wanted to do international business in Brazil and I was too late for, to apply for that. So I needed to fill, in, fill, up, fill out a year of not, not knowing what to do. And I thought, well, I just got baptized, I should maybe learn more from the Bible. So I said I, want, I was gonna uh, study theology and I signed up for, for one year theology and it was doable. I started that first year and that was probably the hardest or the toughest year I've ever had because while I was doing it, I was planning on studying international business afterwards, but 
at the same time, I was, I thought I was hearing God telling me to, to study theology, to, be a, to become a pastor or a missionary. And I so did not want to do it because I wanted to have a family and I wanted to feed my family somehow, right? <laughs> um, and uh, I, I didn't want to do that. I seriously didn't want to do it. So after this one year, I, I didn't study anything else. I went uh, to work with my dad for a year because I just couldn't um, decide to study theology. But then it was pretty clear that I was going to do that. And somehow God was going to provide. He promised. And I did the last, well, I did the three years that I still needed to go. I uh, finished my thesis. And then I became a theologian, a bachelor in theology that didn't know anything. <laughs> That's at least what I feel, felt like. I felt like I had even way more questions than before. Or I felt like I had this book in my hands and had, I had read it a lot of times and a lot of parts of it many times. I had read other books about it, I had no idea what it said. Um, so I was again reading some parts of the scriptures and then um, this, one, this one passage from the Bible just became one of my favorites because we usually don't have a good image of, about Sadducees or Pharisees, right? But I actually like this one. He was testing he was testing Jesus I know that I'm aware of that but still I liked his question and I'm gonna I'm gonna re read it again just to remind us hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees the Pharisees got together one of them an expert in the law tested him in this question with this question teacher which is the greatest commandment in the law there's one German um, version that says, what is the most important thing in the Bible? What is the most important? And that's the same question I had, because I said, there are so many things in the Bible, but what is the most important? I cannot do that, all that. That's impossible for me. So this passage became one of my favorites. And actually, this expert in the law, I kind of, I kind of liked it. Because I said, he is asking the right question, and he is asking the right person. He's asking Jesus. I know he did it to test Jesus, but I'm, I'm thankful it is in the Bible, because it says a lot, um, even about us. Because I think a lot of times, many churches, as uh, Alan told you, I, I went to Switzerland, I was in Canada, and I grew up in a German church in Paraguay, and there's also a lot of Latino churches in Paraguay where I go to as well. So there are many different churches and many different denominations, and all of them claim to have the truth. Every single one of them says, yes, we know what the truth is about. We know the right answers. We know everything. And that's okay. But this guy, <laughs> he asks Jesus, he asks the right person, and I really like that about him. And I think that it shows our reality. And that's something else, I'm going to go back a little bit, what I actually like about Mennonite World Conference. I could tell you later on in person more about it if you want to know. But Mennonite World Conference is just um, a conference of, with all the churches around the world, the Mennonite and Anabaptist, other Anabaptist churches like Brethren in Christ, uh, coming together and the conference that takes place every six years is just one small part of it because there's I like MWC or Mennonite World Conference because there's so much so much diversity there's so many churches so many colors so many languages so many cultures so many just of everything and I, I really like that as I said I grew up among two churches maybe um, the German church in Paraguay and the Spanish church. And then I was in Switzerland, in the Swiss church. I got to know, um, I worked in Thunder Bay in Canada with First Nations. And I went to their church, which was really, really interesting. Um, this is my first time in, in the United States. And I said, okay, if I'm here, I need to go to uh, New York City as well, and Washington DC. So when I was in New York City, uh, before I went there, I 
learned about a Bruderhof, which is close to um, Amish, maybe somehow, and a little bit to Mennonites as well. And I said, I want to get, I want to get to know their community as well. So I went there, and then I went to a church, uh, African American church in, in Washington D.C. as well, and it was just so many different churches there. Everybody was so different, but at the same time, you could see there was one same goal. There was one same person these churches would worship. And all these differences had one thing together. And that's something I really liked about them. And as I said before, we claim to know the truth. And a lot of times, at least this, this happens in Paraguay. I've just been here for a couple of weeks, so I don't really know a lot about the context here. Um, in Paraguay, a lot of times we criticize other churches. We say, well, no, they should do this this way. And maybe they say the same thing about us. Probably they do. Um, and this person, this expert in the law, an expert in the law, he had studied the Bible more than I did. He had studied the Bible and followed every single thing, part of it, for many, many years. And the Pharisees as well, they knew the Bible. And they go to Jesus and they ask Him. And I think that's a good, that's a good thing to do. And Jesus' answer is more, even more impressive. Um, in Spanish we say, if you don't want to answer a question, you will answer it, but not answer the question, just about talking anything, right? So you go around the topic, that's what we say. Um, and Jesus doesn't do that. He could have started, make an introduction and trying them to like him and I don't know what else, but he just goes, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. Just like that. It goes on, but I'm going to stop here for now. And he, do, saying this, he almost quotes Deuteronomy. I hope I said that right. The fifth book, right? Um, he almost quotes Deuteronomy. Why almost? Because in the and other parts of the Bible, the same verse, it says the same thing. But instead of saying, well, he says, with all your mind. But in, in the Old Testament, it says, with all your strength. So there are these people coming up to him, knowing a lot, a lot of the scriptures, of the laws. They're experts in the laws. And he tells them, with all these things you know, with all these things you've studied, with all these experts you're in, you should love God. You may know a lot, but just by knowing, it's not enough. I think this is a good thing for all the thinkers, for all the people that know better than other churches, or churches that know better than other churches, or denominations that know better than other denominations. First thing they should do is love God with all their soul, with all their heart, and their mind as well. Because that is what the truth is actually about. If we knew everything in this world, but we didn't love God, then it was just everything in vain. It would not be helpful. And then he goes on and he says, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Well, I like people. I like hanging out with people, actually. I really enjoy, I'm a youth pastor, and part of, like the biggest part probably of my job is hanging out with people and talking with them, praying with them, and doing a lot of stuff. So I really love people. Actually, we have a so-called a so social drink, which is uh, a terere or mate. You might have heard it. It's a cold or hot tea, but we serve it in a horn, and we have this weird straw. I shouldn't bring it. And 
and you have hot or cold water and you serve, but everybody drinks from the same straw, from the same, out of the same horn. And it just goes around the circle. And we drink it from 7 a.m. up to 10 o'clock in the evening. Um, just anytime, anywhere. People who can go to college with their thermos and their... It's just, just something really normal you wouldn't see here. Just like people have their mugs here probably, it's the same. And, uh, and that's, that's a, it's called a social drink because you, it, it's really boring to drink it all by yourself. Because you forget about it, then it gets bitter and then you have to then you start all over again. So you drink it with people all the time. And I actually like to do that. And it says, love your neighbor. Well, that's what Jesus says. Well, that's great. Because I do that. I love my neighbor. But then it says, as yourself. And that is the most shocking part of this passage of the Bible. Because we do a lot of things for ourselves. We treat ourselves just as no one else. Um, I know that everything is really different here in, in the United States. I only knew the United States um, or from the movies. <laughs> or from, actually, when I was in Canada, there was a river that was the border, and then I saw the United States. So I threw a, a rock all over here. <laughs> I hope it didn't hit anyone. But that's all I knew about the United States. And I know in Paraguay, even if the standards are pretty lower, everything is not as high quality as here or, or whatever, but we treat ourselves. We, get good, we make sure we're okay. And we have good food. We try to buy the best car. We try to go to the best schools. Um, I'm living here in a house and these guys are really awesome because they have people all the time. I, I could just take you there after service and they would be okay with that, all of you. Uh, they have a hot tub. I'm just saying, they have a hot tub. <laughs> um, they have widescreen TVs. Okay, maybe that's normal here. In Paraguay, that's not normal yet. But they have widescreen TVs. People travel a lot. I've been traveling a lot. Um, we fight for our rights. We make sure we are okay. And then Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. So everything you do to yourself, everything I do to myself, shows how much I love myself. I know there's people that harm themselves, but that's because they need to relieve themselves. And I know there's a lot of people that have a lot of issues with themselves, but deep inside, every person loves himself. himself. Every person tries to get a better life. Could be in, in, in health or, or yeah, in wealthiness or whatever. But this is a really shocking part of the Bible. And I know in, in the States, I realize that in Canada as well, people are really friendly all the time. Well, can, Canadians say sorry all the time, right? Uh, it doesn't happen that much here, but <laughs> you guys are really friendly. I, that's, I didn't mean that. I, you, you guys are really friendly, and I like that. Like, I was talking to the bus driver in New York City. He, he, he asked me where I was from and stuff. And People are really nice, but I think loving the neighbor goes beyond just being friendly. And I know this is, this is really hard, and this is not my favorite passage because I'm a really good neighbor lover or whatever. This is one of my favorite passages because Jesus himself says this is the, one of the, this is the greatest commandment. And it is one of my favorite passages because it's really challenging me. Because being friendly isn't such a hard thing to do. Then again, loving another person just as I do myself, that is a really hard thing to do. Like sometimes it's even hard for me in the bus to stand up to let another lady or whoever um, really needs it to, to be able to sit. These small things sometimes are really, really hard. Actually, I, I was surprised. This is my first 
English Bible and everything just the first time in English and the preaching as well. Um, but the, the word neighbor, I was surprised about that because for me neighbor was just people that live next to your house, right? And usually in big cities, well I, my city isn't, isn't that big but it's a capital city, so people don't know, not really know each other in the city. Um, I might not know my neighbor, their names or anything. In, but in, in Spanish, it's always the person that's just right next to you, the closest person. Um, the people that are close to you just in a normal, regular life, like in a regular day. Because oftentimes in Paraguay we would say, um, love your neighbor, and then we would talk about the people we have to love or give money to them who are begging for money on the red lights or traffic lights, um, because there's always people wanting to uh, wash your car a little bit just to get some money, and yeah, we should give them some money. But there's a lot of other people. And maybe in Paraguay, is, there are a lot of poor people we need to help. And I'm very aware of that. And I don't, I don't know what it's here, but I know that there is a lot of people in deep needs as well. And actually I thought loving God and loving our neighbor are two things that are very separated one from another. Uh, I thought, well, I have to love God and then love my neighbor. But then I read in the Bible in Matthew 25 verse 40, to 43, and I will just read this part, not the whole context. The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. So actually what we do to our neighbors, we do to Jesus. How we treat our neighbors that are in need, is the way we treat Jesus. Loving our neighbors is also loving Jesus, loving our God. So there is a, there is a very strong, um, I, I want to say, relationship between loving God and loving our neighbor, which I hadn't noticed before. And this is something that really is challenging. And it might be not be someone begging for money uh, on the door or on the traffic lights in, in the United States. But is it your actual neighbor you always say hi to, but you ne never really got to know? Or is it that single mom or that single dad, dad that's struggling with a lot of things and would kind of need some help? Or is it that young person that never had a father or is it that older couple maybe, whose family is far away and they would actually like some company. Maybe it's just some company. Maybe that's all they need. Or is it that person who's always lonely and has a hard time finding friends just because of stereotypes. If we start thinking about our own needs, um, we can project them to the other people. Because we will, those other people around us have needs too. They might not be the same, but there are some basic needs every person has. If it's a, if it's a person that's um, easy to hang out with or not. I feel like there's a lot of needs in people more emotionally than anything else. Because sometimes um, back home we think, okay, if I help this person or if I'm starting a relationship with this person, I'm getting to know this person, he's, he might gonna want 
some money or some extra help. And I mean, I feel really bad about that. And sometimes we just, we say, I can't do all of that. But we do so much for ourselves. I wanted to encourage you brothers and sisters um, and myself to look less to ourselves that each one of ourselves could just um, be smaller, get smaller and the other person bigger, taller, more important because if we do that we also love Jesus by serving Him. Amen.